Let's see this game. I suppose you were versus Tinker, yeah? Yeah, I'm pretty sure this Tinker is a Smurf, but uh, I'll, I'll leave you. I'll leave you to tell me if if, it, if you think it is or not. Um, I played against him a couple times, and uh, I haven't been able to beat him actually. I have solo killed him before in other matches, but uh, I I don't think it was the case here. Just from the Tinker matchup, I would say it is it would be impossible to decide whether he's a smurf or not because every single Tinker just plays the same. They will spam their spells on you. It doesn't take a higher MMR player to execute Tinker's rotation. Yeah, I, ju I just feel like he's like the fastest Tinker I've played against. Well, there's in always the, the option of scripting. True. Well, anyway, uh, tell me about this matchup. Uh, what, it still should be fresh, still fresh on your mind, so what exactly do you remember about it? What were you feeling frustrated about? What did you feel good about? Stuff like that. Uh, I felt good that this game, I did go for a Kaya, I think it was, because uh, the Tinker started to snowball and I knew that he was going to get a Hex, because he always does that against me. So Against you personally, as a player versus player? Uh, yeah, like every time we play this matchup, he goes like, uh, he goes blink into into straight hex or blink into axe into hex, which he did this game. That's interesting. Okay, continue. So I decided to then, I think I got a BKB first and then I got a Lincolns with a Kaya Sanj. Let's get moving. Yeah, I, I did review your items before them. Uh, when you first contact me, and, and yeah, I think the items will be a big talking point. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about it when it comes to that. First, let's see how the laning goes. Uh, against SF, would you buy a wand? Uh, I usually don't. And against SF, would you buy a self? Yes. If if he if if he knows how to play the matchup, I would have to buy a self. And if you wouldn't want to be greedy, you would just assume that SF knows how to play and then just buy a self regardless, right? Yes. I would say Tinker's damage output with the lasers and then the laser is pretty comparative to SF, so in the future you might want to opt in either for stick plus branch tangos or the self. While the damage is pretty, I would say, low level one, if if you get rotated on, or if he solely the focus on harassing you, he can easily out damage your branch tango. So just like with the sap, if you don't want to be greedy, either of those two options will say will he will give you more security in the lane. Uh, either the wand plus your current items or the self plus your current items. Oh, but he did get laser level 1, so he's not as big a threat. Yeah, he always tries to uh, get the denies with the laser early on. I see you try to wait for a moment where you could deny the, the creep. And the moment never came. But yeah, so far so good. Nothing out of the ordinary. How many hours do you have on Storm? Um, not sure. I can check in a bit. It does look to be at least over 100, you know the basics. Yeah, definitely. I have 500 games. That's nice, that's nice. <laughs> but why did you opt in for the Wardex? 
I think this is a, a small mistake I do sometimes where I always go for Vortex. But yeah, I can see why this game I should just go for more Remnant. Yeah, yeah. It's it's always dynamic, your skill, your skill build. It's, it's always adaptable to the situation. Tinkers, I wouldn't say you would have many opportunities to Vortex him. At level 5, you should take Vortex because by level 6 he has a potential to die. Level 3, I would say, is a bit too early. I actually always max uh, max uh, Remnant in every single lane just because I feel like I can always stack on, on, uh, and farm faster than the other mid and get my timings. Um, I would like to know your, uh, your thoughts on that. Right, so it is a little bit complicated because technically it's always the more safe always guaranteed to work play because the camps are almost never threatened you will always clear them easily but there is another side to that a bad side is that if you're going for a farm lane every single time then you're not really practicing uh, good rotations with the kills either on the mid or on the side lanes you're basically playing pve while neglecting the PvP side. So while in the match-to-match -match basis it will most often be the more safe choice, sometimes, quite often in fact, going for a kill lane while riskier, either in the middle or side lanes, while riskier and probably just a little bit less uh, gives less personal net worth, you do hone in your skills on how to perform pickups correctly, without Orchid, while being lower level. And as a bonus, very often it can boot either the carry or the mid to the jungle. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Okay. To summarize, against, kill, against uh, lanes where you could go 50-50, like maybe it's a kill lane, maybe it's a farm lane, I would say for the sake of practice, you should try to make make more of those kill lanes instead of farm lanes. Like the Tinker here, it's mostly a farm lane because you let, unless you have a good farm advantage at level 6, he is quite hard to kill, especially if someone rotates. I myself, I would still make it a kill lane because I'm really comfortable jumping Tinkers and SFs and stuff like that because I play many kill lanes as kill lanes. So yeah, you yourself could also find matchups where you could opt in for a kill lane instead of a farm lane. Did all of that make sense? Yes. Yeah, SF, I, I tend to make it more a kill lane if possible than Tinker. Um, and uh, whenever I play against any spirit, I, I always tend to go for kill for kills on them. Especially versus, versus Ember? Ember uh, Ember is a bit trickier. If he if he makes a mistake, then I go for the kill. If if not, then I play it a bit more safe. Yeah, but I okay. I always try to harass him with right clicks. Even if I I only have one point in uh, overload, I just click him and click him until he loses some HP. If then I can break the the flame guard, then I then I go for the kill. Right, Ember is I would say among some exceptions, which I would not try to make a kill lane. Because unless you get a nice little clean kill before level 6, or you have a significant an advantage, chances are you'll both hit 6 at the same time. And if you're investing heavily into kill lanes, or not investing in farm lanes. And Ember, like I said, unless you have the advantage to either a kill or the nice. If you invest in a, far, in a, in a kill lane and he hits level 6, he is no longer killable. And you will need to make it a farm lane anyway. So yeah, Ember, Ember, I would say it's always more risky than it's not. So against Ember, I would say farm lane is to go. Oh, sweet. Well, seeing as you have leveled Vortex, do you see a potential for a little play here? 
with the vortex. Yeah, I could have uh, maybe gone up to him. And, At the very uh, least, the good vortex had denied the creep. Yeah. Yeah, and bonus points if you can hit the combo with that as well. It's a minor thing, but sometimes minor things add up. And at this moment, as Tinker is walking off, do, would, you, would, you, would you see an alternative play to what you're doing? Something, something you could do more efficiently right now, right here. I should have pushed the lane faster. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. All right, you see, it's good. If he's leaving, you know you'll have a, about five seconds of absolute free farm. And that should be enough to at least clear those both range creeps and prepare Melee creeps for our remnant in case he does come back and kill you. Yeah, I think the mistake was that uh, I was thinking about the rune a bit, and uh, I should have just pushed the lane. Yeah, with, with that you could have had, could have had both. And right now this is really risky. Vortex, uh, another Vortex, his laser and la laser and uh, missiles could bring you really low or even kill you. And now the spam begins. One little extra efficiency I can give you is that... You know Tinker went for Rune, you know he will have mana resources. If he has mana resources, he will absolutely just spam his shit on you. So as long as you still have reach and you should... Uh, even if you don't feel danger, dan in, in danger right now, you should still pre-use it. And just make sure you're always above 50% HP. If any of them smokes and rotates, you're dead. Yeah. Like Branch Tango. It should have been used 10 seconds ago. That way you will also feel more comfortable killing the range creep. With more health. It kinda worked out. You're making some really risky decisions here. Which could have been prevented. With the things we've talked about. So yeah, just like against the Seths, to mitigate Tinker's damage. I mean, you you know for a fact he will keep spamming on you. So in the future matchups, what you can do to remedy this, like I mean, right now he essentially just kicked you off the lane, but while doing so, at the moment he is in no position to continue harassing you, because just to kick you out of the lane he had to use all his resources, he has no mana, he has no battle. So imagine in an alternate scenario, in this lane if you've had just a little bit more tango, so just a little more salve. And as you reach this state, instead of going jungle, you just uh, back up a bit, eat his health. And that's it. Now you're back in the lane, and Tinker cannot harass you. So to summarize my few sentences is that if you know the opponent, he's just going to keep going on you. You can pre-buy yourself more reach in advance, and situations like these will not happen. Um, One question when... um. Uh, so when you buy a, a salve in the early on, like before the lane starts, uh, is it fine if I don't get the first water rune bottled up? There is no clear answer. It will always depend on how aggressive your opponent goes, because one guy might just go aggressive on you, the other might not. This tanker, he went for a laser, so you did receive less damage overall. But like a Huskar SF, they will most often try to force it to self. So again, it's matchup dependent. Some heroes you can judge in advance as Seth Huskar. Some heroes, like a Tinker, they might have different play styles, which will depend on how much damage you will take. But if, like I said, it's about greediness. If there's a chance you can be booted out of the lane, 
it's always best not to take that chance and have a self or extra tangos ready. Because right now, I, I bet it's not really comfortable for you to be like clearing the small camp. You would, I would say you would much rather be in the middle of the lane, pushing in, tanker, so he's under the tower and you can take both runes, right? That would feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I've managed to do that, but not against this guy, I guess, for the salve factor. Yeah, so so fortunately, this is a really easy fix. It's simply pre-buying extra region as you see needed. Like I mentioned, it doesn't matter if Tinker is a smurf or not, because that's what all Tinkers will do. They will simply use spells on you. And you can always uh, plan in advance to counter that easily. Additionally, you can start taking raindrops as soon as they become available, which will also make it harder for Tanker to boot you out. Yeah, that's something I really forget to do. Here's the cell. Uh, again, I would say it's it's uh, 20 seconds too late, but better late than never. Okay. Before I rewind, did you see a missed opportunity? Um, not really, no. Okay, let's watch it again. What about now? No, I, I don't see it. You know the Tinker will not have laser anytime soon. So you know you can right click him easily. He's also within your range, so what if as soon as we see laser getting lasered? and we see laser expiring, we time our movements to go up to Tinker, use the Vortex combo, and now he eats Revenant, he eats right click, and he eats at least three tower hits. Would you say that's a good trade? Oh, yeah. Yes. That's I, 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 trade. Think I, was, I would think I was just thinking that uh, maybe he could kill me with the rockets. But yes, if I can definitely pull him under tower, I think it's it's worth it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I could I could say there is a risk involved, but he wouldn't have time to do both rockets and right clicks if he is being vortexed and eating tower hits. Like you could sink in two, three right clicks. You might eat the rockets, but you still have a bottle, you still have a stick. I mean, as soon as you're done with the combo, just uh, back off and use the self. So I would say you sh you have a good chance to survive it, at least, I don't know, 150. About 100 or 50 HP. And not really in the kill range. Well, yeah, this is dynamic. I could see that if you're afraid, you shouldn't go for it. My mental math would tell me to go for it. Your mental math might tell you to be really careful, and that's not really a mistake. The point I'm trying to make that the opportunity was there, and you should always, in order to calculate the risk for a movement, you have to see the movement first. So there was a movement, which in the future you can see and then work out in your head in the math if it's if it's worth the movement to make the play. Uh, one tip I can give you versus Tinker is that in between the laning stage, before the first ward expires, you can send yourself to uh, sentries. Because you know for a fact that Tinker will want to have a high ground vision on you, to spam rockets. So you know for a fact that if you place two wards, 
on the opposite sides of the river, you will eventually see the ruin. And those engines will not only pay for themselves, it will deny Tinker some rockets. There we go, nice. Radiant's courier has been killed. I mean, other than the few minor inefficiencies, I think your lane looks fine. Radiant structures are fortified. Can definitely climb tree mortal with the landing skill set, so I'm betting your weaknesses are somewhere else. Yeah, I think my weakness is definitely the items I buy, and uh, the the other one is the mid game. I think uh, sometimes I win my lane very hard and I manage to lose the game somehow. Yeah, mechanics will bring you all the way to Immortal, but uh, from like 6k to 9k to 10k, it's all about knowing where to be on the map, why to be on the map, and when to be on the map. I'm, over here. I'm sure we'll find stuff to talk about here regarding the topic. So yeah, landing's pretty standard, nothing too interesting. One thing that bothers me is like you said, you're gonna max run and you make this a farm lane. And you did max run and you make this a farm lane. But you're not playing a farm lane. All I've seen you do is just harass Tinker without any real results because you're not geared for kill lane. So for the last like 3-4 minutes, you've been really active in the lane. But the problem with that is that while you've, you've geared yourself with a skill build, with the items with the soul ring for a farm lane, you haven't actually went and sacked any camps. All you did was clear like a small camp two times, I believe, maybe the dodge one. But the thing about uh, farm lanes is that the best way to play them is use fastly, uh, swiftly clear the wave, go make a stack, get back to lane. Go make it, and then repeat the process, kill the wave, stack the camp, get back to lane. Tinker really cannot do anything to prevent you from doing that. So if you've decided to play a farm lane, then just forget about Tinker. Do your thing. Push the wave, stack the jungle. Come back. Let's see the net worth. Yeah, Tinker is ahead. You're 1k behind. But there is no way he's preventing you from flash farming. So this is a big thing that I haven't talked about. And if this scenario is kinda your thing, like if, if you catch yourself doing this a lot, fixing this, fixing this, being conscious of it will definitely let, let you win some let you win harder because you'll you'll have like one K more net worth, which is essentially thirty percent better landing stage for yourself in the future. Do you see what I'm talking about? Do you, if you would yeah. look back at your lane movements, would you agree that the, the camp movements, while geared for a farm lane, were minimal? Yeah, I think I I didn't manage to push the lane hard enough on many situations in, in this lane. And uh, when I was trying sometimes to maybe go for a stack or something, uh, he would have pushed the lane very hard so that I would have to come back to the lane without having the stack. But maybe I should have just done the stack and maybe missed a creep under under the tower and it's fine. That's the thing. Tinker is really bad at hitting towers and Tinker is not that good at pushing waves. Because while he does have laser, it's not that big of a deal as it's not as good as a remnant. So if you both arrive at the same time, inevitably you're gonna push into him and then you can leave. 
And if if you're not there and the waves meet and the Tinkers tries to wave clear, because he will need he will still need to do some right clicks, do the laser, maybe do the rearm. In most of the cases, the lane will be slow enough that by the time you return, you will still have like maybe four clips, maybe three, maybe two. But you will always have the ranged one. So in any case, if you leave the lane and you come back to at least two creeps and you have the camp stacked, that's the better play. Now, before I take this rune, what goes through your head? What are you thinking? Uh, I should bottle and uh, place a remnant before and be full before taking the rune. And I should look for ganks. With the yeah, ganks. yeah, yeah. The first one is, of, of course, correct. But yeah, I was thinking more of a, of a second second part. So yeah, if, when you're approaching the rune, you can always take a moment to do the map in your head. Like, what can I do with this rune on the map? So what would you say you can do with the rune? With the map, I should look bottom to see uh, how Drow is in the lane in phase. Yes, very good. Because bottom is the closest, Drow is weak. You can always get a kill on her. That's a that's a perfectly sensible option. Yes. Especially if it cannot make place in the middle. Uh, we could make a play in middle, but he was not. Sh I think he's not showing. Yeah, he's jungling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I mean. If if you're not really comfortable, you don't have the full picture in the middle lane. You can always check the side lanes, like with the tides, ultimates, and drows. General squishiness. I would say. Immediately trying to make the kill happen would be the best play, best rotation. Yeah, I can see that. If, if Trow had like three heroes in the lane, which is possible, they have uh, DS, which likes to play alone, so they can rotate. If Trow had three heroes on the lane, then yeah, I could see how you would be more cautious, but you can, looking at the minimap, you can still see everything going on. You know, you know that if if you go, it would, be, it would be safe for you to mostly get a kill, most likely get a kill. Again, it's it's a good skill to have, like glancing at the minimap and extracting information. In this case, it would be seeing two players stop, and you know that Rob is weak to your gank, especially with Tide's ultimate. That's pretty good regardless. I mean, best best case scenario, we got a kill on their course. But either way, Draw was dead and Marcio, the other core also died, so... And DS also died, so yeah. Display worked out. That's good. But what I wanted to highlight with this is that you should always look for the more more beneficial kind of pickoffs. So uh, let's let's paint a different scenario. Let's look at this in a vacuum, actually. Imagine two parallel universes, two parallel scenarios. One of them, you go kill top, you kill Mars, the Drow lives. And the other one, you go kill bottom, you kill Drow, Mars, lives. If you kill Marcy, where is she gonna go? Uh, she will go back 
top, most probably. Yeah, she will go back top, so likely your team would not accomplish anything. If you kill Dra, where would she go? Jungle. Yeah, that's it. Goodbye, you just have to jungle. So you can see in a vacuum when making decisions. If you think about it, you can pretty easily deduce which play would be more beneficial. So clearly, killing Dra will put her off the jungle, will keep tied the free lane, will, will free up your support. And most likely the tower will be taken. So can you see in the vacuum how, how big of a difference makes the correct target choosing? Yeah. Additionally, now you, you plus one, or maybe just a support, can smoke. And go into their lower jungle. Place a board. And what that means is that Tra will be easily killed in the jungle again. She will lose even more space, and her, her only safe location will be Triangle. And just like that, with, with the two movements, which we can plan in advance, we essentially reduce it, we reduce space for the enemy carry just by half. And these kind of efficiencies you will need to think about in the future. If you can recognize them. What are you thinking about it yourself uh, during this match? Um... No, not really. Um, sometimes when I win the lane harder, I do tend to gank uh, the safe lane multiple times till they leave, or just force the tower somehow. But uh, no, this game, I, I wasn't too sure what I should be doing right now, because uh, I had the farm build, so I didn't want to find that many uh, kills um, but yeah I should definitely think more of more more of these things just to gank more bottom or just pressure one of their cores to not be in lane yeah yeah uh, one more note about what you said is uh, you did mention that because you've taken up a farm lane, and like I said, it's a farm build. You don't feel comfortable ganking. This is not a good thought process. Because while it does make sense if you and the opposing mid laner are very close to the net worth, in that case, every single little bit of stats matter. And you being kill prepared for a kill lane versus a farm lane in the mid lane versus a similar net worth core, every single health piece counts, every single mana counts. But would you say that's still the case if you if you're not fighting the enemy middle, when I start ganking side lanes? Would your farm lane status, farm items, farm build actually gimp you there? Yeah. Why? No, I, I mean like uh if I have farm build yeah, I can I can definitely still look for kills on the side lanes. Yeah, draw. They're yeah. cores, they are cores. They will definitely be less farmed in the mid lane. And you will have enough of a build room to just kill them. Plus, you will always have your help, the help from your team. So even if, even if you had just one point in every single skill, that's still a vortex combo. That's still your team helping you. So the way you mentioned it, you didn't feel comfortable because of the... Uh, farm build, you can still absolutely go wreck the sidelines with the farm build. Because they don't need much. They, all they need is blue to show up. I mean, you saw this yourself in the gang top. You were pretty comfortable killing them. Despite being on the farm build. Radiance Middle Tower could use some help. Okay, so once again, we're approaching the rune, and you must be thinking to yourself, where should you go? So where should you go? Uh, I think I should probably go into their jungle to see if maybe I can uh, find the drow, or go bottom and help Tide take bottom tower. Yeah, yeah, that's really nice. 
if you look at the st stage of the game right now, this this is the key moment where you guys could just snowball to victory easily. If you look at the state of the map, would you say your other two lanes are having a good time? Uh, Tide is having a good time. He's just a Tide unkillable. And Spectre is kind of the same. So yes, I think uh, my side lanes are fine, but we should we could pressure a tower together. If your side lanes are fine, then we can we can draw conclusions that the enemy will not feel very comfortable playing aggressively in the side lanes, and they would feel more comfortable just nuking their ways and going jungle, which also tells us that both of their position one and two will AFK farm in the jungle, which is which is really easy for you guys to as a team choose a region and boot where, whichever core is farming they're out. Like the easiest, the most convenient way to do it is of course take the bottom tower and then, and then establish your base in the lower jungle. Alternatively, we could also establish our base, our camp and campment on the triangle. Uh, the point is that if your teams are strong, if your lanes are strong, then most likely the enemy team is weak. So, whichever region you guys establish as their own zone, the enemy should be unlikely to fight, and they will give it up. And that, as a, in, and that in turn will simply give you new space and deny enemy space. And how did we come to that conclusion? Is that all the lanes are fine? Which also means that both their cores will be AFK farming in the jungle, aka greedy draft, which is being very prone to being punished. Did all that make sense? Yes. So I think, based on what you said, I think the best course of action would be to have some wards in one of their two jungles, either the triangle or the bottom bottom jungle, and either kill Tinker or kill Drow. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, is this a solo rank or is this a party? A solo. Rank? Uh, solo. I I most often play solo. Okay, that's that's cool. Uh, do you often try to rally your teammates? Yes. Uh, sometimes they listen. Sometimes they don't. Uh, when they listen and it goes, everything goes correct. We win the game. If they don't listen, uh, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Okay, got it. Uh, so at this moment, if you feel comfortable talking to your team, I would say that Willow has no right being in this jungle. The region does not need any protection. Spectre is not in danger. At most, you could be stacking. But I would say the better play for Willow is to smoke with you. And I just go claim a region, I would say bottom. Or maybe four of you could just push the tower. I'm sure you agree that whatever Spectre plays, you guys should play the opposite off, and vice versa. So four of you could simply go bottom, and that would still be a good play. Or you and Willow could just uh, invade their jungle, look for Drow, kill them, and then take the tower. Either way, either movement you make will result in space denied for the enemy. So if you, if, you, if you can recognize those uh, kind of movements, those good movements, you could always reach out to your team. I'm sure they will see reason. Like you would say, hey, Willow, come smoke with me. Let's invade the jungle. I'm sure they would agree. Radiant's middle tower is under attack. And the last thing you should do is go to your own jungle. Because essentially you're just mirroring enemy's movements and wasting all of the potential your team has right now. Yeah, I can see that. This is the pitfall of all the low MMR games. They have the advantage, but they don't recognize that they have advantage. And both teams AFK farm until the status changes. Like if this was a pro match with the same same draft, the enemy team would simply not have any outer towers by now. Because they couldn't defend. Even then, 
you can draw conclusions yourself that Tinker will play around the middle, maybe triangle, and Tribe will play lower jungle or the triangle. We don't know for sure which uh, where is where, but we know for sure that they will not be both at the same place. So if you smoke yourself solo with full health, full mana, go to the lower jungle, place the ward, you'll definitely find one of the cores and kill him. Because you're strong, you have region. And what's this on the minimap? This is Drow. So just as predicted, we will see one of them in the lower jungle, which you can easily invade. Especially when you see their other cores currently being extremely open in the side lanes, which means it's a solo kill. It's a relatively risk, relatively risk-free solo kill. Do you see it that way? Yes. Yeah, for sure. I should have just gone. Even if Willow didn't uh, want to go to their jungle, I should have uh, gone gone there with a ward and a sentry, maybe. Yeah. Just just smoke yourself. It's always uh, feasible to just use the smoke on yourself, especially if it pays off. Like like Drow, there's no way Drow survives you. She's yeah, she doesn't even have silence. <laughs> yeah. And even better, she will die. She, Tinker will rush to her place, like maybe their supports will rush to her place. You make a kill, either you use region to zip out or you teleport out and that's it. That's that's just one little move and look how much space we would deny from the enemy. We would force rotations, we will open up the side lanes for more travel pressure and the trial, the trial will simply no longer feel comfortable anywhere but the triangle, reducing even more of her space. So yeah, these are the things you can be thinking about. But look at this, look at this, look at this. The three of you just killed DS. And what's going on? All of you are just leaving the lane. Why aren't you guys pushing? Uh, my, my thought was uh, it was almost 12 minutes so I could get the contest the rune and uh yeah my tide should be pushing the wave yeah fair enough you yourself are not that needed because they can handle the lane on their own because they're fat but if you recognize this, these scenarios you can still just try to rally your team like uh tide and who's the brown one oh that's tide and the green one yeah tide and willow just just go back to the lane and, and just just make a little tower damage just push and then you can take the rune and join them easily. You can just farm your way back to the bottom. So these are the things you should talk to your team about as well. He has all the freedom to engage and disengage, and wards would counteract that fact. Uh, so in other words, while before you could just freely zip anyone, so if your team was showing, you could just go in. Right now, without vision, in areas without vision, you cannot do so anymore. Because if you if you make a large zip, it's, uh, they they simply will counter rotate. But if you have vision, if you have vision, if you can pick a, a sea tinker on the minimap on the map, if you can go on it first, you know, he probably will die with Spectre's ultimate and maybe Tide's ultimate and then whatever Villa will provide. Ah, that's a really long sentence I'm trying to make. So, to summarize, to make a point that. Before Tinker has Blink, you guys can just waltz in on foot 5 and anywhere and make plays. After Tinker receives Blink, you will have to play around Vision. Did all that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Alright. Yeah, here my tide was... See how he's uh, ungankable anymore. Yeah, my tide was like, I'm gonna ravage this Tinker. And yeah, that happened. <laughs> Unfortunate, unfortunate. Nice. They're beating on Dyer's top tower. Um, what are your thoughts uh, about going Kaya versus Orchid? I've I've tried going both routes, but I still have doubts on my item sometimes. Uh. 
we're gonna have an entire session on not an entire section on just optimization. So let's skip that for now. I can immediately tell without even seeing what's going to happen in the future that you will not kill him. I wouldn't even go there. I mean, by sheer luck, if he makes a mistake, you might get a kill, but it's always all of the risk and very little reward. Chance of succeed, succession. Let's see if I'm correct. You are. Yeah. You shouldn't even go. You shouldn't even go. That's it. Half mana last bit of battle, and I think accomplished. Was it because he was next to his tower? Well, because the tower still stands. That means the enemy team will still have one or two heroes playing there. Which also means that the vision is most likely also there. So your gems will be easily telegraphed and dodged. Okay. See, just by glancing at the mid-map and confirming that the tower still stands, we can draw the conclusion that they will have vision. There's so much information, pieces like that, uh, peppered throughout the map, and you, all you gotta do is just recognize them. Again, we did have information just a little, mi just a minute ago. We saw a Queen of Pain around top. We do see Tinker bottom. I'm not sure if we had vision over Marcy. But anyway, what I'm saying is that we had enough vision on people that can prevent you from killing Drow, so Drow should be dead. Yeah, I, w I wanted to sip on her here, but then uh, then I thought to myself, if I die here, the game's just over. Because I, I thought I, I, I knew I was behind a bit on the tinker and if i just feed draw now a kill then uh i had no one with me this would make sense if there was an actual risk for you dying but as you're walking there you have your eye on the minimap you confirm tinker is bottom is going to be at least 10 seconds before he joins the fight you also saw queen of pain top so same for her, and even if she does join the fight, and she's Queen of Pain, she, doesn't, she cannot do anything, she doesn't have a silence or a root. DS, he's dead, same case. Mars, she's dead, same case. Like, you had all of this information, as soon as you draw, you know Mars just responds, it's gonna, take a, it's gonna take her a few seconds to come to middle, even if she comes. So what I'm getting at is you've had all the information to make a decision that if you do jump draw here, they ain't gonna be able to respond in time and she dies. All you need is a vortex combo and a few zips. That's like three seconds, four seconds stops. Of course, the longer you wait, the later riskier it becomes. So if you had a chance, it was one second to go. Yeah. So would you sip from, from the river, like around the moment I, I usually when I walk distances like that and I have nothing to do, I would keep scanning the minimap, and I would immediately notice a very juicy teal colored dot on the minimap, and that's it. I am already zipping there. Because as from, I have walked. From this, from this, from this yes. place, you would zip? You, you still have wand. You make a big enough connection. I mean, you can also deduce that she will stand in place because she's drowsy, she will multi shot. You connect your big zip, you will still have enough mana for a vortex combo, she's dead. She's definitely dead. With level 12 it would be easier. But even so, she, she, she should be dead. Yeah, I agree. Again, it's not a bad play. It's not a bad play. In the end, you, 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 you didn't die, so that's a that's safe play. It is a missed opportunity, that's what I'm saying. Dyer's top tower? 
Uh, which of the towers would you say right now is the easiest to take? Bottom tower. Why? Uh, because uh, it's harder for Tinker to spam spells from there, and uh, because it's it's uh, their dead lane. I would say that with the information we had, I think it now has blank. And Tinker being their main defensive point. I would say all of the, all of three of the lanes are equally hard to take down. What differs though is that only the mid tower currently yields us some good map space if taken down. Like if like you said, if you take the bottom tower, it's a dead lane, nothing changes because no one is there in the first place. If you take top tower, nothing really opens up. They still have full access to the triangle. If you take mid tower, that's it. You now have rune access, great vision, and those two are really important. So if we can deduce that in our games, where we want to play at. Like right now, what we, in the, the information we had is that the Tinker is really fat with the blink and all. All three towers are still standing, so you should make a move. So, st uh, the same thing still applies that 5 versus 5, your team is stronger because you have Tide Zolt, you have Spectre Zolt. So, if all five of you have cooldowns ready, where do you go? middle. If you don't have cooldowns ready, then you still need to, to have all three lanes pushed out. I suppose Spectre could push out top. You're playing, you as a Storm are playing around the middle, so that's correct. Tide. Let's talk about Tide for a bit. Tide is the one that will turn team fights early game the most. Because early game Ravage, they will not have PKBs. They will most likely eat Ravage. So, where Tide should be playing? Uh, he should be mid when Ravage is up. Yeah, he should be farming towards mid from the bottom. Because if the fights break out, you're gonna want a Tide to be there. I mean, ideally, you will want all the players, but of the three, Tide, Willow, and Shadow Shaman, Tide would have the most turnaround potential. So, just like you said, bottom is still dead lane. So even if no one shows up from your team in the bottom to push it in, that's still okay as long as you trade it to a mid tower. If that would not be the case, I would still set. Uh, you would still want Ty to play close to you guys and send one of the supports to D push. If that would be the case, bottom. The only player that can farm whatever he wants is Spectre because of the initiation thingy. Spectre, by existing, she allows your team to be way more flexible with their map distribution. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a mistake I do commonly where we have all our cooldowns and I'm like, yeah, let's fight, let's take a tower. And oh, yeah. usually we go bottom. And I can see, uh, based off your explanation, I can see why that is very wrong. If you look at the draft in the vacuum, not even in the game, if I sat you down in the meeting and showed you a picture, five heroes on the Raiden side, five heroes on the Dire, and I've asked you a question, which team takes towers first? You would say Dire, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, it's very, ob very obvious from the draft. So the fact that you guys have such a huge advantage, and by minute 15, none of the towers are down, it points, it, it says a lot about, I'm not saying you, but team's awareness of their power spikes. So like I said, low MMR pitfalls. If you yourself can recognize that and rally your team like tight, you have ultimate spec, you have ultimate, let's all go mid. And even then, you can still buy smoke yourself and say, hey guys, let's smoke. And then you walk first, you walk towards middle. What's the team going to do? They're going to follow you. So the, what I'm saying is that there are ways, even with uh, teams that are not as aware as you could be, 
as long as you see, as you, as long as you recognize those moments, you can still try to make plays with it, with your team, rally them. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely try to to rally my team in many games. Someone better help Dyer's middle but yeah, I, I can see that we should be pressuring mid tower right now. And as a storm. As a storm, I am pretty sure you would feel way more comfortable knowing that you do have vision over the runes, and they do not. So again, there's nothing preventing you from getting a sentry, two sentries, and one, and one observer, and just you being the person that establishes and maintains rune vision. Because what are they gonna do? Chow isn't gonna sit around mid farming. She's in the either in the triangle or the bottom lane. So if trial isn't mid, there's no one there that can kill you. They don't have enough burst. Marcy could chain stun you, but as you see here top. So again, we glance at the minimap. We extract information. Marcy is top, Trow is in the jungle. There's no one killing you. So even if the enemy sees you in the river, establishing vision, they can't do shit about it. The vision is yours. Go take it. Yeah, the, the same pitfalls that low, low or MMR players, they just, they see a potential kill, they go for the kill. Did this kill matter in the long run? Not at all. Not at all. I don't think it will translate to any objective. All you do is now you're in the zone where Spectre wants to farm. So now you're wasting time either taking Spectre's farm, which is a no-no, or just walking not killing anything, which is also a no-no. So this play, this hero kill, it just it just cancels out by the fact that you're either not not making making space yourself or taking spectre space. Like the three of you are in the middle. Why wouldn't you go in the middle and help the team push? Yeah. That's I can the, see that that's, now. Yeah, that's the conclusion you should have drawn yourself before you teleport at top. Mars is there, so what? You have a mid tower. To take. And the team, they're just. They don't know what you do. They kind of want to go. They don't, they don't feel like they can go. But with you there, I would think they would feel more comfortable going there. Especially as we can see they're trying to establish vision again. So just be there. You don't need to show, but you can be the moral support from behind. Because they know that if they get jumped, they can fight back with the Ravage and the Wards. And most likely win. So yeah, five, like 20 seconds ago, you go on Mars. That was a detrimental play for your entire team. Radiant have fortified their structures. Yes, you're here, that's good. Eventually you're here. Away. It should have happened way sooner. Oh, no, no, no. What are those wards doing? One second, I'm just waiting for the point. I'm, uh, I'm gonna begin to talk about this fight. Right at this moment, what information did we just receive? Uh, we know Dark Series in the trees, 
and Marcy. Not exactly. You see Dark Seer use ultimate. What do we do with this information? Uh, we know he's gonna vacuum. That as well, afterwards. We know they want to fight. In terms of target priority, after DS uses his skills, would you say the target priority of his goes down? Yes. Like, if you kill him, what changes? He already busted his spells. So your attention is less likely to should be focused on him. Because he did use his spells, and now he's not as good a target as Tinker or Spectre could be, right? Yeah. As soon as you see heroes use their big ultimates, their target priority, from your perspective, drops way down. So at this moment, your attention should be fully focused on the cores you can't kill, or should kill, just Tinker and Drow. This is also how lower MMR players lose team fights. They simply are not thinking enough about the targets they should go on. You've heard Spectre's ultimate. Right now, your full focus should be where Spectre is and helping her. You see how yeah. easy it would be for you to champ right now instead of focusing the yes, Tinker would die. Draw would die. Very easily they both could die. Instead what happened is you were too focused on the target that is among the lowest priority targets. Essentially wasting the team fight and causing the death of your carry. The death of your carry would still might have happened, but you yourself would wipe the floor with two of theirs. And in the end, he didn't even kill the S. It caused a chain, chain depths. You guys, see, you can see now looking back how a single different decision would have turned this whole fight around. Did you see this moment yourself, uh, fresh in the game, like after you died? Hmm. Maybe I should have selected a different target. Yeah, the thing was that uh, uh, I didn't I, I didn't uh, see anyone fast enough in that case. I guess when I heard the haunt, I should have uh, seen exactly where the other cores were. Yeah, that's why I've talked about the target priority. Like, as soon as you see DS drop his, you should be looking at the better targets to work on. I'll take that. Likewise, in this game, Queen of Pain is always the lowest target priority because she simply has nothing to threaten you with. It's a 4 versus 5 as, as, as far as you're concerned. Yeah. Dyer's bottom tower is under attack! Dyer's middle tower is under attack! But yeah, at least you now have room control. Even before I saw you die, I, I wanted to pause and, and to ask you if you feel like you should be here at the moment. The answer came on the screen. Yeah. Because again, they have all the information. When you look back at this game, 
yourself. Imagine I'm not here. If you would re if you would watch this replay on your own, wouldn't you notice that, among other things, DS is very hard to kill. Yes. And now we add the fact that none of the team is visible, and you can just simply conclude that the best case scenario you get him to have he runs away because you're out of mana. Worst case scenario, the team jumps you and you die. All of this information was telegraphed before. So that's what I'm getting at, is that you should... As you're playing, as you're watching your own replays, you should look for these moments. Look at your depths and you can tell yourself that they could have easily been avoided had you been thinking about it. In this, in this case, I was actually thinking about it. And uh, I still went for it and I died. Lesson learned. Yes. Again, Tight has ultimate, Spec has ultimate. Your first idea should be to group smoke. Get a, get a kill, get a tower. Yeah, here I <clears throat> I told uh, my team let's let's take this bottom tower. But uh we end up trading it for our mid tower, which I don't think is very worth it. We'll get to that, we'll get to that. Now, again, let's talk about your mindset, because I'm sure you will repeat this in the future, so I want to help you see this mistake, help you see it before you commit to it. What is the one lane you shouldn't go? Right now, as we respawn. Uh, top lane. No. Well, mid mid because we already took the tower. No, it's the bottom lane. Why? Because if you go there, you essentially boot Spectre out of the lane. Okay. You're stepping on Carrie's toes. Like we said before, we play whatever Spectre isn't. Unless she's in the danger of dying, and you can use her as a bait. That is, if four of you smoke up behind her. And there is no reason for you to go where Spectre is, because all you're doing, you're simply taking farm away from her. When you as a storm could be pushing some other lane. So if you look at, look at the lanes, the top is pushed. That's nice. But the middle, the middle kind of lacks vision and is uncontested. And that would be your top priority. To, if there's a potential uh, ward, you get the ward, you ward mid. If not, you can just teleport, block some creeps, and do a quick zip, click wave clear, and zip out. What that will give you is that Spectre will continue farming, someone from their team will have to show up and defend, some of their team will have to show up and defend top, and with just this little movement, we will now, infor we will now have information on their heroes. If we have information from their heroes, then we can use that information to decide which lanes to play at further. Well, like maybe Drow shows here, and March shows here, what does that tell you? That they will not show here, and this tower will be easy to take. And if that's the case, then you can just simply farm your way here without stepping on your carry stairs. Did all of that make sense? Yes, uh, I think in this case I didn't go mid because I saw that Tide was mid. So I just thought to myself, Tide can probably just push that wave and I can go do something else. But yeah, I can see why farming my with the wave bottom is not ideal. Yeah, this something else should never be towards the direction of your carry, because you're just griefing. You're not wrong about a tide, you're not wrong. Tide can absolutely push out middle. But that does not mean you should go towards your carry's flash farm rotation zones. So would you have, let's say, gone towards the top uh our top jungle or their bottom jungle to farm it you will, still want to, you will still want to play on metal 
so you still teleport middle and then you could maybe take these three camps and be ready to take the rune in 30 seconds because the willow there's no such thing as taking farm from from your willow in this game so yeah I myself would teleport middle, either here or here, and then just zip to camps, get those three camps, and be ready for the rune. Okay. Not much good's happening to Radiance Bottom Tower. <laughs> Radiance Bottom Tower is under attack. By default, if you are a core hero capable of pushing waves. Would it be better to push a wave or jungle? Push the wave. Yeah, it's always pushing the wave because it's the information, it's pressure, it's space. So, if you haven't teleported here, what most likely would happen is Spectre would, feel sim would simply feel very comfortable just keep go keeping going here and just pushing. And right now what happened is that she, she saw you she backed off and now she's in the jungle. Just like that. Option A was Spectre was pushing here. Option B was Spectre jungling. Option A clearly was the better option. But we, through our actions, made sure Spectre chooses option B. So you can see how such a little, like, natural movement, like, not even thinking about it. Okay, let's go bottom. You can see how much such a little movement can, how, how big of an implications it can have on the entire maps distribution. Yeah, this is one of the reasons I chose this game because I felt like a lot of uh, bad things were happening and I couldn't understand exactly why some of these things were happening. And uh, I think a lot of it may comes to the fact that we weren't uh, going for the right objectives at the right time yeah more or less and uh, in this scenario that's gonna happen around now is because i i kind of greased my specters farm yeah with, with everything we've talked about so far are you getting a are you having easier time seeing the minimap and extracting information just as as right now as we're talking if i would pause would you would you say you already feel good about you know where to look for information like extracting information are you thinking things right are you thinking things you weren't thinking before the session yes for sure yeah that's great because uh some some of my games go like this where some weird stuff happens and I don't understand why and some of them I think I actually do everything you're kind of telling me to do but I do it unconsciously and good things happen but uh, I haven't been able to do that like every single game yeah I know what you're saying this is uh, this is something I always notice in my students is that uh, they simply react to things happening when in reality they should make those things happen like a uh, 3k mmr player will react to let's say a wave being pushed in to make my impression and the 6k player will be the player that in fact has made that wave to be pushed in he made the scenario that forced the, the enemy team's response while the 3k player simply reacted to enemy team's response not sure if that makes sense yeah it does Again, all, all this space, all these potential plays, and the entirety of your team is just stuck in your own part of the map, in your own jungle. Yeah, I think at this Making point, I was, happen. I was telling my team at this point, I'm pretty sure let's do something and uh, 
no one responded, so I just decided to farm the ancients. Right, we can begin talking about the items a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, I haven't went orchid first in about a year. Would you know the reason why? Um, so on my experience, when I go orchid first, sometimes it's like it really pays out and I kill their other cores with it in different occasions or I make ganks happen, but sometimes I go orchid and I orchid the guy, he doesn't die and like then what? Uh, yeah, there's two parts to this scenario. So part one is, so imagine in this game that Orchid is not a thing. In the early game before Tinker has blink, would you say you would be able to kill Tinker solo before without the Orchid? Um... If, if no one helps him, I mean if you see the enemy minimap, you know no one's gonna rotate for a while because they're busy. Just one on one, can you kill Tinker? With Orchid, yes. No, without Orchid. Without Orchid, uh, yeah. it's a bit slim. I mentioned I... that you, the waves in the waves are in the middle. Tinker's like level six, level seven, and he uses laser. He doesn't see storm, so he uses laser on the wave to clear it. That's that cute champ. I, I yeah. can definitely kill. You champ, you kill him. And the point I was trying to make is that. In very, very many cases, while you can make kill with Orchid, in many cases you can make the same kill without Orchid. So that's already a 50-50 on a do I need an Orchid question. And now the second part of this, of this whole equation, the whole picture, the big picture is that if the enemy groups or if the enemy has easy time defending towers, your orchid becomes useless, just nothing. So yeah. So what I'm getting at in point in the first point it's a fifty fifty. In the second point it's also a fifty fifty whether the enemy groups. So the bottom line it's it's always fifty fifty whether the orchid will play out or not. But if you went the other items, they would still function without risk. Like Kaya is just raw stats. And then BKB is BKB. Well I'm sure it will mo all make sense in the end. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I'm, I'm explaining myself properly. Uh, the bottom point for this segment is that orchid first will as often not work as it will work so the safer option is to simply not go work it in the first place yeah that's what, that's what i do in my game sometimes. so basically the only time work it will ever pay off is if the enemy team is spread out and they're not grouping up and trying to fight that's the only situation but then again, they could just get together and my orchid is useless. Yeah, yeah, there's way too many risky factors. The only I, games I, I go happens. orchid myself is that when the side lanes have absolutely crushed, when I have absolutely crushed, and I know for sure that we're gonna play in their zone, that they will be spread out, they will be under farmed, and the orchid in that case simply becomes a win harder item, which could actually have been the case in this game. Your lanes did crush, your mid actually was fine. If your team have played correctly, if they have established camp or their jungle, if were they more active in the towers, then Orchid would have paid off. So, we have just discovered a third factor. Is that while the, the first two cases where the team is ahead and mid is fine is correct, if it's a low MMR game and the team will not, will not rally with you, then it's even, even more of a detrimental factor of to, for you to have orchid. Yeah. Now imagine if we have done four four K of this gold into BKB, you would already have BKB. So while your team 
he's not comfortable making fights now because then you just took a few bad fights the enemy is now stronger should you happy can be by now once again your team will be ahead that's a power spike for your entire team yeah that makes complete sense it's very often the case the storms complete orchid they get a few kills which they would have and have gotten regardless whether they had orchid or not and then the enemy team simply either groups up or hides in their jungle and now the orchid is just doing nothing sitting in your inventory slot yeah i was gonna when it, yeah when it could be converted into a defensive item I was gonna say that exact thing because it happened to me a couple days ago where I had a really early orchid. I killed two. I, I got like two pickoffs, and uh, their team proceeded to play the same side of the map together. And uh, I just had an orchid that didn't do anything for ten minutes. Yeah, that's why I myself very rarely go orchid first. It's always most most often it's a Kaya first and then a defensive item as needed. It could be A on disc, it could be Lincoln's, it could be BKB, it could be Sanch on Kaya. Uh, and do you ever go work it after a Kaya Sanch or after getting the defensive item you need? Kaya and Sanch is the defensive item. It's the kind of item you get only when they have like really mild disables. In that case, it would be enough for the mid game. In that case, your defenses are being taken care of and you can go off offense again. So in that case, yes, I would go Kaya, then Kaya and Sanj, and then work on Orchid and pick up the shard whenever available. At least all of you are pushing and not just sitting in the jungle. So that's a good Radiant way. Team fight is done, you should be pushing. Okay, so you see this creep wave. You will kill it. Where should you go next? Uh, take the rune, invade their jungle. Uh, I mean, take the rune, push the lanes, and try to invade their jungle or push a lane. Where is your team currently? Where is the strongest members of your team? Uh, they're all top. They're at top. The enemy will respond soon. Where will they most likely congregate? They will probably all go top. They will probably all go top. So your team is kind of weak without ultimates. If they take a fight, they might die. So I, I'm not really sure if it is the correct play to make. But the point I will make is that regardless of the outcome, you should be making your way top because even if it's most like even even it is very likely that their team will die, you could still get get a get a pick off and escape easily. There's a slight chance that you being there will turn the fight around. Top and the thing is that all of those options are better than you going jungle. Why do I say jungle? Because there's nothing else for you to push right now. Yeah. Radiant have fortified their and instead, you're going to your own jungle, which is absolutely not the play. Radiant's top tower has oh, yeah. At the very least, if you're not confident in your team's abilities, if you can conclude that they don't have ultimates and the enemy team will all teleport top, you could say, Guys, I will not fight with you. Get back. Now if they die, that's on them. You've done all you could. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th I, I knew this was going to be a bad fight. And uh, I think that's why I didn't go for it. But I think that at least I should have uh, gone bottom and pushed bottom. So that wave would have been shoved in. Yeah, that's a good alternative. My god, stop going on that. Yes! At this point, the first, the first 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I would say your team was comfortably the better team, the stronger team that is. But right now, with a few bad fights, uh, you know, you no, no, no longer have vision, and the enemy team will start slowly pressuring you guys. And of course, all of that could have been avoided. <laughs> of course, I like very much like like at this moment you guys are establishing your camp in in their jungle. That's really good. If only it did happen 20 minutes ago. But these kind of establishments they should happen way more frequently. If you can recognize when it's good, you should absolutely try to make it happen yourself. Oh, what I miss. Yeah, you can see how good it is. Is that you have vision? Even when it comes to the war, they kill, they kill you, and they will fight. They will feel very awkward fighting with you here. Yeah. See, you can see how we deduce that creating this scenario where you guys establish camp in their jungle will most likely lead to good plays to good things, which is exactly what happened. <laughs> so, this is a perfect example for you, for you yourself to recognize the importance of creating such a scenario. And, just like I said earlier, to be the better player, you must be the one to create a scenario where you guys establish jungle. And not wait for your team to just accidentally stumble upon the thought that Maybe at this moment I should ward. No. This should always be on your, on your objectives list. The sooner you will make this happen, the sooner you will reap the rewards. That makes sense. Yes. Instead of waiting for someone on your team to eventually 20 minutes later establish dominance in the region, you're the one. You should make it happen. You're the constant player across all, all of the MMR matches. And just see how much, how much of a space your team is given. Like right now, like I said, your team is still kind of the weaker team, but just by playing the map the right way, you are giving yourself a huge advantage. And these kind of plays, they are, they are available. They are at the platter every single game. And all you have to do is just recognize this. Like, looking at this, this is the perfect map distribution. All four of you, you have control of the mid lane and the bottom lane. This is excellent. Spectre is pushing top. This is also excellent. Two lanes under control, and your carry can join the fight any minute. This is the kind of shit you will see in 9 game MMR games. And you and you should make it happen more often, whenever you can. Uh, many of my games go like this, where we actually make all of this happen, and um, many of games turn out like this one, 
and uh, it's good to understand why. Yeah. When you say you make it happen, just I'm gonna say you need to make it happen more often. Yeah. And when you say you make it happen, I'm pretty sure you have the time it's your team that accidentally stumbles upon the thought of such a plane. Like they just go with the flow and they, hmm, I'm going past here. Might as well ward. When the correct thought process is to actually go here with the objective to ward. Not in this exact moment, but overall. I'm just talking about it here because this this little chimney segment is the perfect example of how a good map establishment, good map distribution will by default make you win team fights, which by default make you win games. Maybe not this game, maybe not that game, but in the long run, it will be the reason you are climbing. Just what I was waiting for. This is like the third time you're going on DS. Yes. Like, like, like you have a fetish for him. The party? Here I am. Just what I was waiting for. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you see it yourself. Yeah. But I just gotta ask. First two times you tried and failed. Why? Why did you keep trying? Uh, in this in this point right here, I I just thought that he was the biggest priority target I could get. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely a bad idea. Yeah, well, let's just hope that you. You will be a little bit more conscious about these priority things in the future. Yeah. One more note I can give you guys here as a team. So yeah, the same thing we've talked about is that while you guys have cooldowns, your team is stronger. As soon as those cooldowns are used and you got the kills, you got the kill on Mars on DS. Your cooldowns are blown, and uh, any subsequent fights you take will inherently be risky. So while you cannot, while you cannot make decisions for your team, you can at least choose to not participate in what is essentially a high-risk, low-reward play. Because the way I look at it at this scene is your BKB is about to expire. And there is no way you guys are killing Tinker. If you guys are not killing Tinker, you can't kill Trow. If you can't kill Trow, you can't kill Tinker and vice versa. Basically, after you pull your cooldowns, that's it. You no longer have the upper hand in the fight. So while your team might still might not recognize that, they will might fight. As long as you yourself can recognize, you can tell your team, guys, back, I will not fight. You go back. If they die again, that's on them. But the important thing is that is you yourself recognize that you are once again weaker. If you're weaker, you're not looking to make team fights. You're looking to push all the lanes and gather information. Does that make sense? Yes.
Okay, it, it made sense here because the enemy team was still weak from from the uh, from the subsequent fight. I think it was the the next fight that your all guys are wiped out. That that my sentences will apply to. Yeah, this one. This one. This is where it's five versus five, and you guys don't have any more no guns. I spoke just. Yeah, that that previous fight was okay. That's this is where my monologue mostly applies to. This is the fight you shouldn't have been taking. You guys win or lose this one? No, uh, I think this fight is a win. No, 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 the game, the match. Oh, we lost. We lost. Okay. Because right now it's, it all goes kind of even. Both of the teams are not recognizing their advantages and they're just kind of. Yeah, they, I think they it, feed uh... in turns. One team feeds, then the other one feeds. Yeah, I think it was pretty good uh, when we started to uh, kill Drow a couple times, but then Drow got very farmed and we ended up losing the game. Right. I mean, from an outside perspective, most of what we're seeing here are not inherently bad plays. You're still farming and still making rotations. So, you yourself as a native ancient player, I'm sure half of this stuff isn't actively on your mind. So, hopefully, after this session, while you have play A, play B, and play C, and you would natively, instinctively choose to make play A, play B might be just like a tiny little bit more efficient, and then play C even tinier, little bit more efficient than that. And as long as you can practice, as you can see those efficiencies, those options, as long as you can practice them, you will, I guarantee you, you will climb. That's the far time yeah. to go on TS and he gets away. It's like a cavity sketch at this point. Yeah, that TS actually went like full on defensive items. It was very hard to kill him throughout the entire game. Yet he kept trying. Yeah, what I'm saying is this is a really close game for both teams. So yeah, the team that will consciously make better decisions will always win. So that, that's, a, that's a good match, that's a good example. That's a good, these are the good talking points. These are the ones that will get to attract you, think a little bit more broadly about map distribution, what and what not, where to be, when to be, why to be. So yes, and as long as you can make the, the right decision, matches like these, you yourself will solo, tilt, Tilt the game to your and your team's favor, and it will be just enough to make it a win. Mm. 
analysis yeah I think this is when we lost the game this remaining game to talk about optimization. The thing I have noticed immediately when just looking at the match ID is that you yourself you went overboard with the defensive items. Can you see why? Um, I guess the BKB helps to counteract the Hex good enough that maybe I don't need the Lincolns. Yeah, the thing is, all these three items, they do serve a purpose. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to try to claim otherwise. BKB is really good. Lincolns is really good. And Kain's Hatch is also really good. But the thing is, if you go overboard with defensive items, you're going to lack on the offensive side. So... If you think about itemization at the start of the game, you tell yourself, okay, they have a uh, trial, they have tinker. Those two are enough for me to know that BKB will absolutely be necessary. So if I have concluded that I will go BKB eventually, do I really need Kai and Sanj? Well, maybe just Kai is enough. Do I really need Lincolns? What does Lincolns give you that BKB doesn't? Is there a uh, spell immunity piercing disable? I would not. So, I would think not. So, would you say, would you see now that while well, you had three b defensive options, you only really need one? Yeah. So, now imagine if we take away. The Kaya, uh, the Sanj from Kaya and Sanj, that's 2k gold. We take away Lincolns, that's like 5k gold more, that's 7k gold. With that 7k gold, you would have Bloodthorn and Agonyms. And somewhere in the middle, you would also have Shard. Right here at this moment, you have enough gold. You have Bloodthorn, Shard, and Agonyms. So imagine with these items, you zip right now, you easily kill at least three of them. Draw is dead. Yeah. You zip, you target Draw with the Bloodthorn. Well, maybe not Draw because she has uh, the, the, the Lotus. You target Mars with the Bloodthorn and the DS and Marcy will definitely die, Draw might not die. But that's already good enough because they will not be able to push after this. But because you went overboard with the defensives, you're now lacking offensives. And that extremely gimps your team fight initiation options. And also Spectre becomes your only damage dealer. Which is in the long run, it also gives your team because their team has Tanker, Drow, and DS is ultimate. You make a lot of bursts happen when you yourself, you mostly operate on disables as a team. Do you see? Do you see where I'm coming from? Yes, definitely. So, yeah. In, in the early game, you can pretty easily conclude the items you will need in this game. So, if you decide to go one item, you should not 
work towards another. There will be games where you'll need two items. Well, you will want both PKP and Lincolns because of the piercing disables. Some games you might want PKP and A on disc against, for example, Magnus or Puck. But three defensive items. At this point, you're just griefing yourself. Um, w one question though, why Bloodthorn and let's say not uh, going for Bloodstone or... Yeah, why, why not upgrading that Kai into a Bloodstone? Why would you think that would be stronger? Uh, let's put it this way. In terms of team fighting capabilities, what new options does Bloodstone open up for you? Uh, yeah, it's only more mana. It's only Something. it's only that in between the fights where Bloodstone shines. In the fights, you're not gonna accomplish anything new. With Bloodthorn. What that does is that it increases your damage output exponentially, allowing you to single-handedly kill an attended tanker or drow, right? Yeah. Now add that, add that to agonims, to overload, and you'll very easily perform some really good black holes with a lot of damage and the overload talent. Bloodstone is only applicable if you are extremely ahead and you have extra gold to spare but most of the games by level 25 your bread and butter will be Bloodthorn, Agonims and the Shard Yeah Yeah, 90% of my games uh, end up with where I win it I, I end up with uh, Agonims and Shard and but I definitely don't purchase Bloodthorn until like it's like very very late game but I can see why it can be better than some other I items I tend to buy. Yeah, I, I get Bloodthorn before level 25 in 99% of my games. It, it just opens up way too many kill opportunities. Orchid in on itself is, is garbage. Because the team can save, the team can dispel. Bloodthorn in the same wind can also be saved, be dispelled. But the difference is between Orchid and Bloodthorn is that before Bloodthorn is dispelled, you're dealing amplified damage, which is often enough to severely weaken or kill a core before this is dispelled. Orchid? Orchids will not deal damage until level f uh, until the 5 seconds pass, and by that time they will get dispelled. So Orchid alone is pretty useless, but Orchid with Bloodthorn, just Bloodthorn itself, it gives you so many options to jump anywhere you want and deal significant damage even if it is eventually dispelled. That's the beauty of it. Dire Snow fortified their structures. I am! Uh, do you have any more questions? I don't think we're gonna learn anything new here. Um, no, I think uh, I think uh, I asked a lot of questions already. <laughs> um, mainly the. So every time I'll, I'll definitely go for a Kaya. I think that's that sounds very good. Uh, last time I played against this Tinker, the match before, it was the same matchup, and uh, I went Orchid, and uh, I regretted it very quickly. Yeah, it's a bit fall. It's a bit fall. Well, alright, and if there's nothing else, then we can conclude the session. Yeah. Alright then, thanks for tuning in. See you next time.